Okay, uh, for hopefully the people online can hear me. We're going to kick it off with a presentation from Sakubu from the his Western Central Africa. And if you want me to translate into English, that's okay. But <laughs> no, <laughs> or into French, either way. Spanish? Okay, morning, everyone. So thank you, Austin, to allow us to present uh, a, this uh, small application. So this application is uh, like um, an application to better allow the end users to design their own output report. You know, sometimes uh, from some report we are using no standard report to customize it, but this one can give uh, a possibility of users to go into wait and see and what is like uh, an editor when they can design themselves for the report, adding aggregates information or tracker information and uh, after visualize it. So maybe a demo can be nice. So report builder. So the app name is uh, report builder. We started uh, doing this app uh, for MS project because they have, uh, maybe I can show it quickly, standard report. It is like a score card, uh, school uh, scorecard which one it is uh, most based on the image to allow parent of a student and uh, the community level to understand their, their, their data. Okay. As you can see here, that is um, their on-field report. If I come here for each year, let's say that uh, 21, yeah. I can come in here just to select one school. Okay, let me do that. Okay, and I can update uh, this report. Okay, there is no data for uh, maybe this. Yeah. Yeah. So as you can see on this report, for some cases, you have uh, the value itself, but for some areas, you have like image because we know like uh, for community areas, they understand most image than values. So instead of uh, using the standard report to do it, and that means uh, every time uh, us as a uh, uh, his team, dev teams, we need every time to come and customize it again or to update it, we decide like uh, to make an app where the Gambia team itself can go. As you can see here, we have something we call design. On design side, they can have uh, HTML design things. So they can uh, design their own report like this. If they want to change the information, they can update like what the, the way they, they, they want. And for the values itself, it will be easier now just to come and uh, add if I need this value, if the value is coming from tracker, if the value is coming from aggregate and so forth. So there is a button here we call the configuration where you can go and just select your, if it is an indicator or data element. Okay. You select it like this. Okay. And by default, those fields will be empty. So if you want to insert a specific data element there, what you need to do is just to come and to click into the field. Okay, and just select your data element. As you can see here, if you want to display a value, so, so that you can select a value, but if you want to display a legend, so you can select the legend. But there is some specification also for the legend side. As you can, you know, into the DHS2, currently the legend it is based on label and the uh, colors. But with this app, you can decide that uh, you want to show the, the label, if it is bad or good or something like that. Or if you want to show the color red, blue, or something like that, so you can decide which type of uh, legend you want to show. If it is an image, like uh, for the community level, they cannot understand things, but uh, most image, so you can select the image like this. 
okay but also if we go back to um one minute oh sorry Okay, one minute. Uh, it is, uh, yeah. Yeah. So if we go, we want back to the report itself. There is something we need to understand here. This report also have to show the performance of the current school, but what is the performance of the district, the direct uh, parent of uh, this school, and what is the performance of the region and the national level? as you can see here. So here it is the school itself. Here it is the district. And uh, this one, it is the region. And the last one, it is uh, the performance of uh, the country. So because of that, during the, when you want to add a specific value, you need to specify if this field, it is for the current organization you need to select, or it is the direct parent. That means even in health also, you can make the same report using the current health facility, what is the performance of the district, but also the performance of region and so forth. So that's why we have here parent one, parent two, parent three. So if we here um, select, I select current organization unit or parent one, and I'm doing a report for a specific district, will be the parent one will be the region performance of something i need to see on my report so that is some specification we decided uh, to make for this report but we understand that uh, this layout can help for other proposals like uh, if you want to make like uh, the school uh, the student card as you can see in our emis project also they want to print the student card for every uh, students so here I can come here. I have uh, some chemical we, we have we call the student card. This one also is a builder with the same report builder. I can select uh, my program in which I have uh, my uh, schools, uh, the, the learners uh, tracker. And that is specify if I want to search a specific student by name or by uh, his uh, unique identification or something like that. Okay, so I can, you can, as you can see here, all the attributes I select can come here. Okay, so I can uh, look in for a specific student. Here I can see him, and now I can select that I want to have uh, the student card. So if I want to print it, I can print it based on the good format I want. And if I want to send the SMS, because uh, in Amy's uh, project also, some um, students to have their unique identification. So we maybe we add like uh, sending SMS in so they can add it. So to let you understand that this uh, report builder can do a lot of things. That will be the same thing for Liberia. Currently, we want to make uh, his uh, COVID vaccination card. So we build also the COVID certificate with uh, the same app. Like we can see here, you have uh, like it is, and now you can select uh, the program itself uh, and uh, looking for the specific, uh, okay, yeah. Oh, I don't remember the, again, maybe I can look in for like this. Let me put A here. Yeah, so I can have, uh, and as you can see here, now you can have those ones, what were what, what, like uh, the data and so forth. So again, the end users now can come themselves and they decide that, uh, yes, they want like uh, to up uh, update the design of uh, themselves uh, without coming to see us to do it for them and something like that, yeah. So basically, that is the idea behind uh, this work, just uh, like uh, to allow people on the field to make uh, administrator of countries, because sometimes we know that they don't have, they don't know better the coding and something like that, but they can 
build their own report just to come and select if it is track aside. You need just to come to a track aside, specify the program itself and just pick if it is that element from stages or from the attribute and just uh, add it on your report. And now you can go and uh, visualize it. Yeah. So the next step of this work now, it is just to add the visualization coming from the DHSU itself. So the goal is like uh, to build the bulletin based on that. So if it is like uh, a monthly bulletin of countries or something like that, they can come and they design it uh, the way they want. Just uh, pick some visualization coming from the DHS2, like a report table and uh, visual uh, chart and so forth, so they can have uh, the good layout and uh, yeah. Thank you. That is uh, what I want to share with you and have your feedback uh, how we can uh, improve it and uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, then maybe Amber, I can ask you to talk uh, quickly. I forget where you were exactly. There you go. Um, to present on a, an application that was uh, built by uh, PSI around uh, program configuration. Very cool application. So sorry for all the technical difficulties today. You have to listen to me riff a lot in between everybody else's presentations. Hello. Okay. Thanks. And I'm on someone's laptop. Um, so uh, he's loading it up. What I'm going to show you today is the, um, it's not a super creative name. It's the program configuration app. Can you guess what it does? <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was born from um, a need to actually create supportive supervision checklists. Um, so like quality of care when your clinicians maybe are going out and assessing the health facilities. So I know our Ministry of Health um, uh, participants know what that's like. Um, so during those visits, uh, we basically do checklists in DHIS2, um, and they were a pain to maintain. We started them using events like seven years ago, um, before Tracker was robust. Um, and so this tool, and I'm like breathing weirdly. Okay. I think that's better now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so this tool, um, I'm trying to riff off of my first three slides, um, basically um, allows us to uh, configure. So from the supportive supervision tool, it turned into a, wow, well, we're actually in this. This can actually just configure tracker programs for us. Um, and so instead of going from data elements up into a program, you can actually start from your program and go down. Um, and so why this has been really interesting is because it can also kind of lower the technical skill bar a little bit. So if you don't have um, super deep training on your bench, um, it allows you to still work in tracker um, and kind of get around some of the challenges um, when you do it the, the classic way through the maintenance app. Um, so on the, it's probably quite small. Um, I'm sure these might be shared. What I wanted to highlight, so I'm just going to show you like two, three slides and I'm going to show you like a three minute video. Um, Essentially, it just becomes a generic configuration wizard for you, um, because I know when you're when you're putting together a tracker program and you have to think of every single, you know, I mean, you should actually be planning these out. You should be very thoughtful, right? That's what you should do. Um, but sometimes it's a lot easier to say, big picture, what do we need, and start building your pieces from there. So you quite literally create the program name and you go down. I'll show you that in a video. Um, and we can just go to, so on the left-hand side of the, the, that first picture is just showing you how you can actually upload um, the, the program configuration app can actually create an Excel template for you to download, put your questions and things like that in and upload it. Um, so you can actually have like a quality assurance officer configure their checklist without having to touch DHIS2. Um, so it kind of puts the the work more in their hands and makes them more connected to the tool as well, which I really like. And it doesn't become a very separate IS team and QAO process. Um, and then on the right hand side, um, you can see um, it's, it's small, sorry, <laughs> um, but you can see um, what it actually looks like to interact with the program using the, the app can um, interface. Um, and so you can just create any tracker program you want, um, the rules, um, everything. Okay, thanks. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, so like I was just saying, this just allows you to have more users um, invested. Of course, you want to have like, you know, senior skilled people, you might be working with HISP agencies, um, but this just allows you to kind of have a little bit more um, uh, room to play with it in your hands. Um, and I think when we talked about um, the questions that are in the back here at the beginning, um, the additional riffing questions around the community feedback piece. Um, so I think this is also like a different way to think about configuration. So maintenance app is from bottom up and it makes a lot of sense, but for some folks, it makes sense to also start from program and go down. So it's also a different way to think about configuration. Um, and so we just think that's really interesting to share. Um, Compatibility wise, it's compatible 236 up um, as of right now. Um, and this is all of our configuration, or what do you call it? Our documentation is here. Um, and the app is in the, um, the app hub as well. So feel free to download it, play with it. Um, and our link to our documentation is also on the same um, app hub, um, but they're here on um, Atlassian, yeah. So I just wanted to highlight, um, so these are just some of the functionalities of the tool, um, just to really emphasize what it can do. So of course, we've talked about it, it can create a tracker program. Um, so you don't have to create your option. You could do the option sets much easier as well in, in PCA. Um, I really like doing the option sets in there. <laughs> um, you can reset your sharing across all the metadata. So if you've been cloning the same data element over and over and over, and you forgot to set the sharing settings and the first data element wrong or correctly, um, this helps you adjust that across the board, which is really nice. Um, you can then create a cross-server compatible metadata export. So you can export and import using PCA into two different um, servers. Um, you can actually do a rollback functionality as well. So if you make changes in the PCA um, or into your program and you're like, whoops, <laughs> that was a boo-boo, you can actually roll back into a previous version, which is really nice. Um, and then I still am highlighting the, the clinical quality assurance. So that's kind of that specific use case that this came from, even though now it's more generic. Um, this is where you can create those clinical quality improvement lists. Um, so we're doing this with, um, you know, uh, IQ, or IQCs and uh, right, CQIs, <laughs> CQIs and things like that in, in partnership with ministries. So you can edit all your um, data elements. You can um, use this uh, Excel generated template. Um, you can migrate metadata from previous. If you were ever using h and QIS in the past, um, some of our partners have been, you can actually import um, historical event data into Tracker using this as well. Um, so you don't have to kind of break your data sets. Um, and the PCA itself automatically creates the dashboards that you'd want for, for the quality supervision. So automatically creates it and we're leveraging that in-app um, analytics that's available now. Um, so it's pretty fun. And then I'll just show you three minutes of a video and then I'll be done and I'll stop riffing. Thanks. Presenting the Program Configuration app, an alternative way to create, edit, and maintain your DHIS2 tracker and event configurations. With PCA, you can create or edit DHIS2 programs from a single interface. You can start a new DHIS2 program by completing the basic details and attributes. Once your program is created, you are ready to start adding the different stages that your program will need. For this example, we need an initial not repeatable stage named confirmatory test, followed by a virus load result, a repeatable program stage. Now we need to add the necessary data elements to each stage to collect the necessary data points. Let's start with the confirmatory test stage. New stages are created with no sections. First, we create a new section named test result. Each time you create or add a section or data element, the app will display a blinking label indicating the most recent changes. Now we had the first data element. The data element may exist or not in DHIS2. If it doesn't, we just create a new one we need to collect the result of the test, which should have an associated option set of HIV test results. As we will use an option set that uses text codes, the value type is automatically set. We also need to collect the serial number of the test used. Additionally, we need the lab technician. In this case, 
There is a pre-existent DE users can search using different properties of a data element as the name, short name, and code. To facilitate data entry, we need the lab technician to be collected first. Let's now go back and add the necessary data elements for the virus load result stage. Last, you need to share the program and associated objects with the correct user groups. The PCA allows you to apply cascade sharing across all associated objects. Once the program has been assigned to at least one organization unit, you can access it on Tracker Capture web app or Android. You can, of course, edit pre-existent programs. As we mentioned, this app dev started for the creation and maintenance of HNQIS2 list. When you are configuring a H2 checklist, the app activates special features like special pre-configure stage for action plan or sections for scoring. For the H2 assessment questions, there is special metadata that the app allows easy editing. When inspecting an existing program, you can see how program rules are related to a DE. We display the way that the data element is affected by other program rules as well as the program rules that the data element triggers. Data elements on score section are fed through complex program rule calculations, which are automatically generated and maintained by the app. Last, currently available for H2 program only, but soon for standard DHIS2 program, you can download the configuration in Excel format. You can do your changes in Excel and then import them back. The app also allows you to export your program's configuration in a JSON file to easily import it in other DHIS2 server instances using the import slash export app. This feature removes all sharing settings and organization units assigned. The app is currently in version 1.4 and available on the DHIS2 App Hub. It is compatible with DHIS2 2.38, 2.37, and 2.36. PSI plans to continue the development and maintenance of this app. Future features include organization units assignment, versioning of programs, backup and restore, more settings, direct editing of option sets, and much more. Thanks for watching. Yeah, and if anyone does play with it, please do send us feedback. We're trying to add more features constantly, so um, would love to just know how it went. Yeah, so thanks. Yeah, okay, can we, uh, do you want to go for, for um, Edson? Edson's colleague is here as well, so he's going to present in person um, the application for tracker bulk action, right? Yes, I guess. Okay, hi, hi everyone. I will be doing a quick, <clears throat> a quick demonstration on this truck uh, bulk actions app. I have uh, 10 seconds slides here just to, to show you what, uh, what is the goal on, on in, in which context this app was, was developed.
as you might know, we've been collecting a lot of individual level data. The tracker have, have been uh, increasing during the last the last years, and in some point there is a need of making uh, some actions uh, to a set of tracker entities or, or set of patients. And right now, if you want to do that on the core DGS2 uh, uh, app, we need to uh, perform a lot of, of, of clicks because we need to do one by one for each uh, truck at end instance, we need to perform uh, 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 the action. Uh, we have here some examples of things that we can do uh, using uh, this application. One of them is, for example, if you want to uh, make a permanent transfer, let's say that I have uh, five patients uh, that are doing TB treatment on my at my health facility, and I want to move them for this health facility to a different one. So I don't need to go uh, for each uh, truck at any instance dashboard. I can just go directly to the list, select those that I want to move, select the new health facility, and send uh, them there using n bulk and bulk action. The second task is uh, also related uh, with the bulk deletion. For example, if I'm doing a data cleaning uh, task and I want to delete uh, a multiple, yeah, my my memory is is well done. If I <laughs> <laughs> and I want to delete uh, multiple uh, uh, data. I can also do this uh, the same. Here I have the list of some use cases. Uh, the app uh, is being used or is applied to be used on the education domain. Uh, for example, to move students uh, or teachers for one school to a different one. So we can do it in a bulk in, in a bulk way. Also, we can use to promote students for one grade to another one. If you have a student enrolled in one grade, we can promote a different one using this app. On the health domain, we can, uh, for example, use on the equipment management. Uh, if you have a tracker program that deals with equipment, we can move from one health facility to a different one. And also it's possible uh, to use uh, in a generic uh, approach. For example, if I want to, to, to do data cleaning of, or, or things like that. I will now go to the, to the demo. And I have here the app uh, installed. Uh, basically, I hope you can see. Uh, basically, I have to select uh, the place where I want to, 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 to work. I mean, the program and the, uh, the org unit in order to have the target entity inst uh, list. <clears throat> so here I have a, a short description on what can be done within the app. Uh, let's say that I have a use case uh, and I want to move uh, patients for one health facility to a different one. So I come and select at the current health facility the patients that I want to move. So I select the program, this TB program. I select the health facility. Now I select the patients that I, I want to use. As you can see, we try to keep the capture design in order to make uh, a, more, a very more flexible and, and a good user experience. So after selecting, I come to this button, the bulk action button where I have several options. And on this case in particular, I want to move permanently. So I click here, I select the new organization unit where I want to send uh, those patients. So here I have my organization unit and next I click on, on continue. After that, I'm going to have a summary with the list of the patient that uh, I selected. If I want, I can remove or I can undo if I want to keep. And finally, I click on transfer, I confirm, and I'm done. So as you can see, here I have the summer, five uh, were imported, is it ignored? If I want to see more details, I can come here and it will show the status for each one of them. So if for some reason there is an error with one that patient, the system will keep going and will mark the one they didn't send and I can follow up with the specific error that's going to show me. Uh, the second use case is for example, if I want to do uh, a temporal transfer, as you might know, if I want to do a temporal transfer, I have to select a program stage to indicate which uh, event this or which service this patient will take. Uh, on this case, I can use the same program, the TB program, and I say that uh, the patient that I select will take TB visit at uh, this health facility. And uh, the scheduled date is, for example, uh, today or tomorrow. I can just take uh, tomorrow is the scheduled date. And then I click on continue, the, the same procedure. I confirm and 
I'm I'm done with it. As as you can see, there is an error here. Let me understand what's going on. Uh, okay, there there is more error. Like what something that we did is to try to keep the the the, the feedback to the end users. So if there's an error that occur, we can have here the, all the details of of what we want uh, 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 to do. Uh, the next use case is the uh, let me continue. As you can see, we try to keep the, the same workflow. Is to enroll in different program. Let's say that I have a HIV program or I have TB program, and during uh, the enrollment uh, to the TARF, uh, uh, I do a TB check for co-infection or the, or, the, or the inverse. So if I have the both programs, the TB program and HIV program, I can want to enroll those patients that are positive on TB on the, on the TB program uh, and not doing one by one, but doing it in a bulk perspective. So for that, I select the, the patients and they come to enroll in a different program. So basically I come here, I say enroll in different program. I select the, the program. I don't have the TB program here, the HIV program, so I'll take end program. I also select the, uh, the org unit, uh, the dates, and I go ahead. So basically this is the, the procedure. And then is how uh, we do if you want to, uh, uh, to do this uh, 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 bulk uh, enrollment for our uh, uh, trinket entity instance. As, as you can see, I can, hear the I can hear the report and I'm done. And finally, we also have uh, the option to perform some bulk uh, uh, deletions, uh, uh, but also we can change the status. Uh, change the status, just come here, select the program and say if it's active, complete or consult. Uh, sometimes the end users, they don't complete the enrollment. They, they fill the data, but they don't click on this on, on that complete enrollment. So if you are doing a data cleaning process, you can go to the system and select, and select those patients that you know that they already completed, completed the, the, the treatment, but in the system, they are not marked as complete. So you just come select the program and then you choose the status that you want to, 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 to add and you go ahead. And finally, uh, as I was, I was about to say, we have the uh, option to delete the target end instance. I know that sometimes in many systems, we don't give this a uh, flexibility to do a bulk uh, 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 delete because you know that we can create a lot of problems, but also we can solve a lot of problems. So here we give this freedom to the users to try uh, to do this and use it when it's doing a data review or things like that. And the procedure is the same. You select and then you confirm and you are done with the, the process. As you can see, uh, <clears throat> where I have here a message, like when you're performing a, a task and there is some warning or something like that, you can have here uh, uh, a message to inform uh, what was going. And as I said at the beginning, we try to keep all features that are already available in the tracker app. So the, the working list, uh, the filter, the option to show or hide columns. So everything that is there, is also part of, of, of the application. Uh, thank you. Well, Pete, would, are you ready to go online? Yep, if you can hear me. Yes, perfect. Big Pete. Great. Perfect, thanks Pete. Can you guys uh, see my screen okay from where you are? We can, yes. Great. Um, I'll get started then. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this quick demo on the dataset alignment app. So this app's made to help DHS2 users sync data between data sets that have slightly different configurations. Uh, so we've been using it to help sync data from multiple country DHS2 instances to a central instance. Um, and the issue was all the country instances had their own slightly different data set configurations, but we still needed to sync the data. Um, previously, this had been done using a series of Excel files, which was pretty cumbersome. So we built the app. So it has this purpose-built user interface to make the mappings easier to maintain. And we're using this matching algorithm to actually speed up the mapping process as well by auto-suggesting mappings uh, in many cases. 
So let's see how this works in the app. Um, here I'm on the main page, which is just a list of the currently set up mappings, which can be edited and deleted. Um, but let's create a new mapping. So mapping is from a source to a target, but the source and target can be on current server or external servers. So there's uh, flexibility there. But for this demo, oh, I've been timed out. One second. Let's just refresh for safety. For this demo, we're going to go for uh, children's health on the current server. And then we're going to connect to an external server. And you can see there's actually two options here. So we can connect to the external server using personal access tokens. But if you can't do that for whatever reason, there's also an option to manually upload the configuration, which that will lead you through. Uh, but for now, we're just going to use personal access tokens to connect. So this is more secure than just uh, sending your username and password. And you can see now we have access to the data sets on the external server. So I'm going to map from children's health to child health. And then we'll click configure mapping. So what's going on now is the apps getting all of the uh, data set metadata and all the related metadata. And it's comparing the to the source and the target and seeing if there's any matches. And if they're similar enough, uh, it will auto suggest some. So let's have a look at the data element table to see that in action. So here on the left, we have the source data set and we have the data elements on the left. And on the right hand side, we have the result of the mapping. So where the value should be getting sent on the target. And you can see the applications already suggested uh, a few of these fields for us. And if you look between the source and the target, uh, you can see that the names are slightly different. Um, that's because the matching algorithm is kind of figuring out that they are similar enough and so suggesting them. Now, there are a couple of gaps, though, and that's because the app will only populate a suggestion if the value is similar enough to within a threshold. Uh, but you have the ability to tune that threshold here using this field. So I'll go ahead and update the suggestions. And we can see uh, two new suggestions are being populated. Again, slightly different names, uh, but the app has correctly populated them. And let's go ahead and look at some of the other parts of the mapping. So next would be the AOC mapping. So that's the disaggregations on the data set itself. And in this case, there are none. So the app just maps from default to default. So that's quite useful. And then we have the org unit mapping, which is often a bit of a nightmare. I've done this by hand or sort of by hand myself on many systems. And yeah, it's a bit of a painful experience sometimes. Uh, so hopefully this app will help a lot with that. Um, you can see the full paths being used. So DHS2 org units uh, aren't don't have to be unique in the name. So that can make it quite difficult to perform a mapping just based on the name. Uh, so we look at the full path and that helps the user kind of see, OK, yeah, both the actual org unit and its ancestors seem to be matching. And you can see in this case, the source actually has two additional org unit levels, but the app still correctly mapping this district. Um, quite a few gaps in this one though. So let's try turning up the threshold a little bit further. Great. So now all the org units on this page uh, seem to be mapping correctly. So that's good. And there's one other type of mapping I haven't discussed yet. And that's the disaggregations on the data element itself. So the way the app does this is it waits for at least the source and the target to have been selected. Then it goes away and it looks at the disaggregations on these data elements and it applies that same matching algorithm. 
So we can view the mappings on the disaggregations for a day trial by clicking this arrow here. So we can see there's uh, four disaggregations on this day trailment, and they've actually already correctly been mapped to the equivalent for disaggregations on the target, again, with fairly different names. Um, so that's, that's pretty handy, saves a lot of time. Um, and that mapping is done, you don't have to expand the row for the mapping to be done, it's automatically applied uh, to each of the day trailments where we have a source and a target. Uh, so far, we've only looked at one-to-one -one mappings. So let's go ahead and have a look at this row here. We've got supplementary support and nothing has been suggested. So I'll have a look at this drop down here. And there doesn't seem to be any valid mappings on the target. So this will be a good example to showcase the sync feature. So what this does is it basically refreshes the metadata that this mapping is based upon um, to bring it up to date. So if I go to the target and I will add a new data element, head over to data sets in maintenance and we're working with child health so we'll add children receiving support we save then if we go back here and click sync should get a message saying uh, there's been some updates so i now go back to our field supplementary support We'll see children receiving support, that field we just added is now available, which it wasn't before. And you also see it's at the top of the list. So another thing the application does is it basically ranks the target options by similarity to the source. So whatever options are the most similar will appear at the top of the list. So that's really helpful if the auto suggestion uh, hasn't worked and you have to do it manually. Even if it's not automatically populated, the correct option should be somewhere near the top of the list, which is great. So I've picked uh, that for our target, which, as I said, now means we can have a look at the uh, disaggregations on the data element. Here we've got uh, gender and age band. But if we look on the target, we actually only have gender options. So this will be an example of a many to one mapping, which is also supported. So I'll go ahead and remove these extra rows because we have full flexibility in the any of the mapping tables to add and remove rows uh, however we want. And then I'll just select the correct options here on the source. So mapping all of the age bands for male to the single male gender and similarly for female. So that's uh, pretty happy with our mapping there. Let's go ahead and save. So once we've saved our mapping, we can come back to it at any time from the manage mappings page. Um, open this up here. And we can see all of our auto suggested mappings and the custom one that we did have all been retained, which is great. So the last thing I want to cover is the download feature. So currently what we're doing in this app is we're allowing the user to configure the metadata mappings, but we're not doing the data transfer itself. Although the hope is that we'll be able to use indicator export attributes maybe in the future to make it possible to do that within DHS2 as well. Uh, but for now, you can download the mappings as uh, CSV files. So what we're using this for is uh, we're running uh, some queries on the database, which basically make use of these CSV files to quickly export the data values from the source. And we've got the source data element and disaggregation here. And then it just transforms the UIDs into their target 
um, data element and disaggregation, and then imports them into their database. So it's a very fast way to transfer the data. Although, as I said, hopefully with indicator export attributes, we will be able to support doing this through the API as well, which is a bit more accessible. Yeah, and uh, that's the end of the presentation. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thank you very much, Pete. Lots of applause here. I hope you can hear it. Oh, thanks. I can't hear it, so uh, <laughs> that's appreciated. Passing it on. I'm clapping, clapping for you. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, we're going to move straight on to Joseph Hatt from UDSM, who's going to share a very cool user support application. Yeah, so in order to support these uh, people from all his facilities across the country during reporting period, it was difficult to accommodate them so that they can uh, in time report uh, the data into DHS2. So the challenge was to ensure that we can support them in time so that uh, their timeliness and the completeness uh, will align with the uh, regulations of uh, our ministry. So we had to find a better way to accommodate uh, their request from all his facilities uh, to the central supporting level. So we created an easy uh, user interface uh, for the people who request uh, uh, the data sets, uh, but also accounts uh, that uh, need access to the DHS2 platform for people to report into DHS2. This is some kind of uh, subnational. Uh, Subnational level workflow uh, where a particular person at the health facility uh, may need to request, let's say, a particular data set into DHS2 to the central level. I will put this slide so, so that you can access. I want to go into a demonstration. So, the national level, we just uh, go into this particular app and see uh, those requests from users and they attend them just by one click. Yeah, this particular app we presented last year, but uh, on this particular year, we enhanced it to support uh, requests for user accounts, but also uh, validation uh, rule requests, but I'll go to user account uh, request. So this is an example of user account request, which I'm going to uh, demo. What is the methodological approach? Yeah, given your experience uh, since 2014, that is what we used to build this particular app uh, to ensure that we can easily support these people uh, without a large number of human resource because mm. our team is not such big to uh, stand just for supporting uh, users from around 8,000 health facilities. So the app was tested uh, on DHS2 uh, platform and by 20 March 2022 we deployed it to the live instance at our ministry. So since then we've been using it and the significantly we've seen the changes uh, in need for uh, the, the need for human resource to support uh, uh, these people from his facilities. It works from two uh, set of two version to two forty or demonstrate uh, only two forty. So let me go direct to the demonstration. I've created uh, a user uh, called user support uh, on the 240. So this is an example of an interface where a normal user will be able to see the user support app. So for now, it has user re form request and user account request, but we intended to have the validation rule request, which we haven't finished so far. So what do we have? have? On the form request, request page.
on form request, we have uh, request of uh, data sets by particular organization unit at a particular level. You can see at the top most we have facilities and the data sets. So if I go for facilities and it will list me, uh, it will show me the list of facilities that I belong to depending on my account as a user, maybe at a district or region level. But also depending on your level, you can change this to uh, particular levels that you want to access the reporting tools. So if we need to request, uh, for example, a data set for Mobola, uh, Mobola MCHP, I can just click request a form and it'll be presented with the data sets, which is a uh, uh, attribute disaggregation. So if maybe I want this particular attribute, I can just select it uh, and update. Uh, but also if I go to, I need HIV uh, care monthly data set, I can just click assign. Uh, so I can also remove, let's say staffing and send. By clicking send, then this request will create uh, a request for data set assignment, but also will create a message because before using this particular app, people were using the messaging app of DHS2 to request for data set assignment. So it could have a hundred of messages to attend. So each day we, each of our member in the office has to dedicate two hours just reading the message and attending. But with this now we have dedicated just one person in a day and could use a uh, few hours to attend the request across the country during the reporting period. So you can see, I can see my requests that I've attended. Uh, on clicking view, for example, I'll be able to see, uh, for example, waiting for assignment uh, for this particular request and so on. So what if I, log in as a, a support team. So the support team will be able to see the form request as this interface shows. I don't know if you can see it. Oh. Let me really share. The tab. So this is how the central team will see it. So the central team can be uh, the technical teams at our university or at the ministry level. So they just see this request. On viewing details, uh, one will be presented with uh, the form request. For example, in this particular case, I have, uh, yeah, it is in Israel, of course, you can change on the data store configurations. This is a form request saying I need a, uh, healthcare monthly data set for this particular uh, health facility located on that highlight. The same for uh, staffing. So by clicking approve uh, and confirm, this particular data set will be attended. So reproductive charges as an uh, example. On the user account request, I had one request. How could it be done? Uh, again, let me share my screen to this one. So if I need account to do account request, I just create a new and it'll be presented to a place where I can provide demographics. In our case, we chose to have these few according to the ministry needs. So you can just put the name here, Hamad, Miss, uh, the email, uh, let's say Joseph Art is a phone number and the unit you want to assign. So you can choose uh, the access level. These are configurable. Uh, in a way, you can go to the data store and choose the laws that a particular user or a particular law can, he, can he choose laws from this stage. It's like uh, a tree child, it, some kind of to chat relationship between a user law and the user laws that one can access to the account he or she request. So you can just put in uh, the group also. 
So when you click next, you will be presented with uh, a new uh, interface or the field will be empty now to define another user. So it's that you are going to click next, next, until when you request, you'll be presented with, uh, with a similar thing to this. And when you send, it will go to the message, uh, uh, DHS2 messages, and the central team will be able to approve it. So how can I see it on the messages? If I go here, let me share. So if we go to the messages on tickets, you can see I have uh, some tickets here. Uh, the very first one, I need these uh, data sets. Oh, someone has approved it. That's why I can see on Bilako, the machine will This is a message that is configurable. So a user uh, will see that the particular data set was assigned previously. I was supposed to come into the message and see it. When I attend through the DHS2 maintenance app, then I come into this and write a message that uh, your request has been attended. So the same for this one. Yeah, this wasn't attended. Uh, this is for account request, I think. As the following account you are requested, you can see it has a tag of user account and a number which is a timestamp when it was requested. So if I attend this particular request, you see user support app. Okay. So I can just, uh, it suggests the username depend on uh, availability of this particular account. So you can choose this username and the confirm. That will be the first level of confirmation. Uh, also, this one, J. Abdallah, the staff, you can confirm there. Uh, yeah, let me end there. If I could log with another account, I could do a second approval of the account, and the message will go to the user telling him or her the account requested here the year. Thank you so much. So thank you all. We'll we'll wrap up there. Um, the, I did want to say that there was one more presentation that we had to skip, which was from Nya and Tai. Apologies if I mispronounced your name, Nya. Is that right? Yes, <laughs> close enough. Um, who have a very cool application for ICD-11 coding of cause of death. Uh, they have a presentation at the Use Case Bazaar this afternoon. So go and check out their, their um, presentation. There's also uh, um, another uh, member of their team was presenting in a different session. So you can find a recording of that uh, um, presentation of the application as well. It's a very cool application. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of the day.